So um, I'd like you to welcome Greg Mello. Greg Mello is the uh, co-founder, secretary, and executive director of the Los Alamos Study Group. He's been the leader of that group since 1989. The mission of uh, the uh, Los Alamos Study Group is to seek nuclear disarmament, environmental protection and enhancement, social justice, and economic sustainability. Greg was educated as an engineer and then later as a regional planner, uh, graduating from Harvard University in 1975 and he led the first environmental enforcement action at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. He's a hydrogeologist for the New Mexico Environmental Department and later was a consultant to industry. He's been a visiting research fellow at Princeton's program on science and global security. And his research analysis and opinions have been published in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists, as well as other publications. So, uh, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Greg Mello. Greg, thank you. Well, thank you all very much for coming, and thank you, Tom uh, and other 350.org people, Jim McKinsey and Bill Perkins, who I've just met. Bill? Yes. Yes. Um, and um, not just for this uh, invitation, but for all the fine work. I need to switch you over to your ah. presentation. Let me take care of that. Okay. Um, that you guys have been doing. Um, Go ahead. Yeah, I'm not going to answer that phone right now. <laughs> <laughs> You're reminding me. Um, the, uh, and I was a little bit inspired by uh, Tom's talk, uh, the detailed one with which the podcast was made, um, the, based on Mark Jacobson's plan to go to 100% renewables. Um, I have some issues with Jacobson's oh, approach, okay. um, but um, uh, the, uh, the main thing is, um, well, you'll, you'll see. This talk uh, may be conclusory in some areas, and so I apologize for that. Uh, I mostly work on nuclear disarmament these days, and um, it's going to be hopefully not boring, um, but it is uh, driven by uh, the conviction that uh, a number of the issues that we are working on together are deeply linked. Uh, let's see if this works. Oh. Should we turn the lights down? Uh, I don't know. That would be okay. I'm, I'm in the front row. I'm not a good judge. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, um, since I've uh, never spoken to you guys before, I wasn't sure quite what to put in here. Um, and uh, so there's a certain amount of uh, self disclosure. Here um, and um, and I thought that was an important part of this. I was going to ask for some self-disclosure from you, and but I am pleasantly surprised to see younger faces in this audience. Yeah. Yay. Yay. Yeah. That reflects greatly on the work that's going on here. And um, so uh, this was a stunt, you understand. Um, I'm sort of tired of, um, uh, of decades, uh, a decade or and a half here in Albuquerque of working with people in my generation and older and we've, where we have failed to bring in young people and I regard it as a personal failure, and it is something I wanted us to reflect deeply on. But obviously, something's going on here that's a little better. The other thing, uh, this last bullet here has to do with um, ability to reach out to uh, people in society uh, that are not... Uh, the peace movement, let's just start say, put it this way, the peace movement can be a little marginal. And if you're working uh, uh, against nuclear weapons in New Mexico, you are in a small group. 
And uh, even though you have more power because you're here. Um, so um, that's all that was about. Now, what I think is that we have to pull in people and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go on. Um, maybe the next one. I just threw in this uh, quote from uh, Pope Francis from a talk last year to our own group um, because it seemed to express quite uh, clearly um, that part of what um, is under our control as we work on these intractable issues is our own dignity and our own characters and our own fulfillment and maturity, our own social connections. We control a, a large number of variables in the equation. And uh, so I don't think that we need to be discouraged. I don't think we need to be overwhelmed. And we hear a lot of time, oh, that's so depressing. Well, it's not depressing. We work with great people. We have fun. Uh, and uh, uh, stopping terrible projects is fun. <laughs> and um, uh, so, um, all right, so the talk is divided into three parts. First, there's kind of a long summary because I was afraid the gist of it might get lost, so I loaded, I front loaded everything into a summary. And uh, there's several slides of summary. And then I want to go over something you could just read for yourself uh, in the word in the uh, work of a uh, psychologist, um, and Astrid will smile at me, um, Margaret Salomon, who a paper that um, came across the transom uh, uh, a couple of months ago, and I thought it was pretty good, and I wanted to go over some of the conclusions that she came. Um, the, so the basic thesis here is that, um, that the crisis that we're in is really quite severe, it's ex existential for humanity, and uh, it is not uh, amenable to reform. Uh, it's a revolutionary crisis. And the reason I wanted to say something about uh, being in the environmental movement since the 70s and is that I've been around this a long time and I wanted to, to beg you to um, give me some credence here that um, this is not a simple problem. Uh, it's real easy for our society, let's say structured around nonprofits such as ours, to treat everything like a problem of reform. In the environmental movement, we tend to see everything as a form of pollution, so we need a regulatory scheme, we need, um, the, it's the same pattern. This is different, it's really different. And when the right wing says that carbon dioxide is not a pollutant, it's basically the exhalation of industrial society, they're right. It is really different. and. It is not um, a minor pollutant like sulfur dioxide, amenable to cap and trade, um, and so on. Um, the, these three choices um, come in part uh, from a brilliant analysis by a Russian-American named Dmitry Orlov, um, who distinguishes uh, a neurotic uh, denial from a psychotic creation of an alternative reality. And I commend uh, his article to you, which is called um, Peak Oil Oppositional Disorder, Neurosis <laughs> or Psychosis. <laughs> and he goes back to uh, the old master Freud, and people have followed <laughs> Freud, and makes the point that these two styles of mental illness also have their political expressions. Um, the political expression of psychosis is tyranny. And, uh, and uh, we are, our liberal friends uh, will typically deny the severity of the problems 
Uh, and we ourselves will do that in order to get by from day to day. We'll selectively forget for a while so we can live. Um, and um, so Margaret Salomon, which we'll come to in a minute, um, suggests in a co very coherent, simple way that there's another response, which is the emergency mode. And that we will be uh, praising tonight and linking it with uh, full mobilization, which is the political expression uh, of that. Um, so, um, one of the theses of this talk is that this crisis will compel us to adopt an emergency response sooner or later. So there's no place to hide, is basically, uh, and you all already know that. Um, the essential unity and breadth of the crisis requires a comprehensive response from us. Now, the, the buzzword we heard the other night, last week, is that if it was intersectional, intersectional, that's it, um, intersectional response across issues. Um, but, uh, so the breadth of the crisis provides many points of access uh, across all of which personal and group mobilization is the common denominator and theme. There should be a period there. Um, mutual education, um, communication, respect, and forgiveness are elements of the required atmosphere. Now part of that is taken from a remark that uh, Dinah Vargas, who was in this office a little while ago, said at our teach-in last week, there she is, that the first step is mobilization. The first step, in a way, is to get in the street, is to go to the protest, is to block the pipeline. And uh, because the problems can be complex, and because we are immersed in propaganda, because we are struggling with figuring out what's going on, sometimes the first and best thing to do is simply to put oneself in the company of others who have the same intention and to learn by doing. So instead of study, 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 act, it can be better to, at this point, act and study act and learn from others, with, uh, learn from peers. Um, uh, that f element of forgiveness there is from Hannah Arendt. That's a long, longer story, but it's an essential aspect of, uh, uh, of being able to mobilize a lot of energy and bring it to bear on a political problem. Uh, vows, that's an old-fashioned word. Um, but it's a high leverage approach, and uh, I want to beg you all to make that a little more conscious. Um, it's uh, vows are better than a foundation grant. Um, more important, more powerful. A league of people with um, compatible and serious uh, promises is a very powerful thing. Um, and the kind of social revolution we're talking about here is not something that happens uh, with a once a month meeting. It means we have to commit to each other to um, make a serious commitment to change our, not just our society and our politics, but our own lives. We often say that the quantum of political revolution uh, is the self. The quantum of political change is the self. So let's see. Okay, it's not demographically imbalanced. I'm wrong. I, I, uh, so I'm pleasantly surprised. Um, so um, we, uh, this is a rock we didn't crash on. Um, <laughs> So we don't want to remain politically and economically marginal. And if we find that uh, this persists, we have to change our thinking. And we have to do different things. Uh, some of our core assumptions and ideas are wrong or else wrong for the present context. And how could it be any different? Because 
our context is unprecedented. And our, uh, our context is also one of the most luxurious, comfortable, distracted society that has ever existed on this planet. And that is, we must struggle with that. So we have a lot of work to do, and we must forgive ourselves and forgive others when we don't get it right, because we won't most of the time. Sometimes we think of um, Coyote uh, going off the cliff, uh, missing the roadrunner, and, and he's pretty slow to figure out he's off the cliff. Um, but just because he's finally figured it out, he doesn't really have a lot of grounds to criticize those that haven't. It took him a long time to figure it out. Um, okay, that's a lot of words on there. <laughs> um, and plus they're all packed in with meaning. Um, so we're not too influenced by Exxon's propaganda of, of the day. That's not something that really gets to us. We see through that pretty well. What we don't see through pretty well is the propaganda from the Democratic Party, from the electoral system as a whole, from our environmental groups that we perhaps have a deep stake in because we've devoted a lot of time and, and resources and identity we put into them. We want to make them better, of course, but these two have their traditions. In our field, um, a lot of the lines of influence, if you follow the money and you follow the prestige, why you end up with the, at the State Department or the nuclear weapons complex or the labs. And some, many of the actors in the field really can't function without lines of resources coming from those sources. And, but they're constrained. And um, we need to not um, be afraid of taking bold positions. Um, and what we are seeing a lot of is um, that halfway positions are, not only it's a terrible place to start a negotiation, but they don't inspire anybody and nobody really believes them. And we, we see, certainly see this in our field and it's the typical thing that you would see in any field on the eve of a paradigm change. So you're, you know, it's like, uh, what's an example? Um, before the outbreak of quantum mechanics, the old uh, physics wasn't really working, let's make an adjustment, what about this fudge factor, what about this thing? Surely, yeah, that's a little better, but it really wasn't working. And the data was coming in that it just, it just didn't work. And then Niels Bohr and other people said, wait a minute, there's a whole other way of looking at this. And look at it this way and it all falls into place. So we're kind of at that moment. We're, uh, we are, our ideas largely come from our own experience, which comes from the world of the past. Um, our analyses are typically blinkered in this context. That is narrow, like uh, horses, um, they're blinkers, right? Yeah. Um, blinders. Blinders, okay. Um, um, because we, we downplay the severity of the issue, we cut off all connected issues because that's the professional thing to do. You can't really write a paper, get a PhD, or uh, if you don't like cut out all these connected issues. Um, we tend to forget the victims uh, because they really seldom have the voice. They seldom have voice. Um, animals and plants definitely have no voice, usually. Um, the lower classes, um, we sell them, uh, this group is a little bit of an exception, this Peace Center, um, because I think it's more transparent to victims than a lot of places. Um, and uh, we may make, uh, in our, uh, we may make over-optimistic appraisals of uh, 
possible solutions, um, as um, my hero James Hansen does about nuclear power. Um, just to pick one. Um, it's pretty common in our culture, since technology is a major religious myth that we work with, that we would um, imagine that uh, various uh, technological deus ex machina will, will save us and prevent us from having to make difficult political or personal choices. <clears throat> um, okay, and I wasn't quite sure how to organize this, but um, and we'll talk more about the emergency mode uh, a lot in a minute. Um, but um, what I, it seems that one of the core things is that we just we cannot um, allow business as usual to continue. Uh, and I mean everything. Um, I mean that um, if you, let's say, for example, if you are interest, interested in uh, uh, in waking up Santa Fe, you might come to the conclusion after a while that Santa Fe won't wake up until someone shuts down the opera. <laughs> um, and um, the when uh, Salomon uses the example of um, a, an AIDS activist group that uh, in the beginning of the AIDS crisis they shut down the stock exchange. They um, they came onto the stage of the major primetime news and shut that down. National broadcast with Dan Rather. Um, and well, that gets people's attention. Yeah. And you have to do things like that, I am afraid, at this time, because we are not getting people's attention. I mean, just let's take, let's be kind of honest about this. We're failing. And so we have to step it up. That's a slogan from 350.org, and it's a very good slogan and a true thing. Um, Let's see, most of those are kind of self-explanatory now. Radical degrowth and simplification. Um, okay, we're going to talk about a little bit about why that is necessary. But the basic idea is you cannot replace a first world culture such as ours with a renewable version of the same thing, a climate-friendly version of the same thing. I'm sorry to, you know, if this is the first time you're hearing this, most, some of you are nodding, you know this already. We have a serious simplification that is uh, right ahead of us. We can embrace it or it will roll over us. Uh, we will fail on the climate if we, um, if we don't uh, understand that, I think. Um, uh, a problem here in Albuquerque among the activist community, including myself, is uh, we have to actually be willing to take power. And so we protest issues, we're concerned about police violence, we're concerned about a lot of things, but we <clears throat> only go so far. We are not on the city council. We are not uh, willing to uh, take and use power. Um, I, I talked to Ray Gardunio about that in one evening while Astrid and I were at a walking down Central Water climate protest with the chair club, and he agreed. Um, and E is, uh, is something that basically we can't wait for government. And uh, Chuck McCune, who's here, is certainly a per person who reminds, that, reminds us of that. Um, we have to build parallel structures that work. And so there are some things government has to do, but sometimes people don't, uh, they're doubting Thomases about everything. They, they won't believe it until they see it. They won't believe that renewable energy works until there's a cooperative, a solar cooperative in part of a neighborhood. If they, um, and, but if it's just, uh, we can only go so far with individual example. Um, that's good, um, but a, uh, a neighborhood or a tribe or a school, um, it, it's a lot more if it's not just 
a household because you know there's always a reason why that particular household is unique. And, well, they have money, they can do it. That type of thing. Um, we're going to. I'm not, this is part of the conclusory, uh, this is a big subject, but the fossil fuel economy is collapsing. Now, you get at this by, it, by, uh, watching the divestment campaign, but um, the, there is an oil problem, and we're going to briefly touch on it. Um, it's a, it would be a separate talk by itself. It affects our prospects for war and peace tremendously. But um, more uh, pointedly to us, uh, our civilization is based on oil, and there are some uses for which there are no substitutes, no, uh, no good substitutes for oil. These include aircraft, long-haul trucking, uh, and while you can replace uh, liquid fossil fuels in cars and trucks, you can, it's extremely expensive to do it rapidly. In principle, it's possible, but in practice, it's very difficult. So that's kind of a gray area. But as far as airplanes, long-haul trucks, and ships, uh, there is no real substitute at scale for fossil fuels. What about trains? Trains can be electrified, but it's, it's expensive. But um, We don't have a lot of time to repair the climate. You, you know that. And I, um, I'm... Uh, I gave it. I couldn't actually quickly find this afternoon the, the climate talk from about two years ago. Uh, so those slides are not here. Um, I think it's good to remember that the, uh, and I think all of the nonviolence textbooks kind of start with this. Um, the notion that the government governs um, with the permission of the people is not just a theory. It is a fact, and only a small percentage of, if, if only a small percentage of people actually rebel, governments fall. It doesn't take a majority, just a small percent. The, um, I think that we need to understand uh, this so we are not awed by the authority, apparent prestige, and um, trappings of power that uh, can be arrayed against us. Um, the, then the I is the uh, Puritan um, uh, part of this. Um, I have impeccable Puritan ancestry on my mother's side. And, uh, um, but the truth is that a lot of the segments of our economy and society have evolved in a parasitic manner. And we have to be aware of that if we're going to simplify. We need resources and we need time. Um, I'm not sure that we can afford to send people willy-nilly and randomly to the university anymore. Right now. I think that it's more important to put people in the street to save our civilization, to save the planet, than to take another English class. <laughs> to get in debt, $100,000 a piece right now is the average. And I'm not sure, I do not believe this is valuable. I don't believe that there is, at the University of New Mexico, right over here, I'm not seeing the graduates coming out that we need. I'm not, uh, we are, of course, it's different for everyone. But I think we need to re-examine everything. We don't have a lot of time. We need young people. Um, and um, so uh, we were, uh, before this evening started, 
Um, I mentioned that over the 50 years from 1946 to 1996, the United States spent a little more than $9 trillion on nuclear weapons. I think that's bigger than Tom's figure for transition, it was six trillion something? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, probably seven with the, uh, with the smart grid. Yeah. Um, so, uh, nine trillion on nuclear weapons alone, about one trillion per year on defense and homeland security and interest on the borrowed money of past defense, pro, pro rata share. Um, and what is this for? Well, this is closer to my normal day-to-day -day field. Um, about 90% of it is to uh, enforce U.S. hegemony around the world. Um, nuclear weapons, uh, China and uh, the UK have about 200 nuclear weapons. Um, if we had 200 nuclear weapons, that would be about 4% of what we have. There's probably 10, uh, excuse me, 200, yes, uh, 100 times, uh, no, sorry, 10 times, um, at least 10 times that many nuclear weapons here in Albuquerque. Uh, and uh, maybe considerably more. Albuquerque is the largest uh, nuclear weapons depot in the world. Oh, at least we're number one in some <laughs> <laughs> And um, the, what was said after World War II by the State Department planning staff that the big problem of our foreign policy was going to be how to uh, continued how to receive 25% of the world's wealth while having only, what was it, 6%, 4% of the world's population. Um, that was laid out as the central problem of U.S. foreign policy in the post-war era. It remains the central foreign policy objective. And um, in the climate world, we often complain that the U.S. military is a huge consumer of fossil fuels, which it is. Um, but that's not really the big problem. The big problem is what it does. And um, the tenth thing there is to remind us that while there are differences, um, no conventional political candidate that, um, leaving, leaving aside Jill Stein, but in the two major parties, there's no indication that they understand or could ever articulate the severity of the climate crisis. And that's, a, that's sad, um, but it's uh, just what it is. And um, it's, it's uh, one of the habits we have is that we want to plug into these periodic elections, pour energy and money into them, and I'm hoping that uh, the um, those of us who have been doing that um, can realize, uh, can liberate some of that energy for more revolutionary uh, and committed action because we're not, um, what we are left with uh, this time is about what we were most likely to be left with when this started and uh, neither candidate is going to help us very much. What's that? Bernie doesn't get it either? No, Bernie doesn't really get it. Mm. No, not really. They can't. He's better. He's better. Bernie's better. better, yeah. Why, why do you say that the purpose of nuclear is to uh, stop us from taking climate action? Yeah. Um, that is a very uh, concise uh, conclusion. The purpose of nuclear weapons is to serve as the uh, an aegis over conventional expeditionary forces around the world. That's the primary purpose. The primary pur purpose of nuclear weapons are to condition diplomacy and military action and to serve as escalatory control in conventional conflicts while also creating an ATM machine for defense contractors. Yep. And all of this together um, to the extent it's not just pure greed and uh, kind of a club, an ideological club, 
um, to the extent it has a coherent purpose, its purpose is to apply pressure to advance U.S. commercial uh, and state interests around the world through hundreds of bases. And the emphasis of all of that is to um, get these resources and keep other <coughs> countries from getting them. So it's uphold fossil fuel use. What's that? It's to uphold fossil fuel it's a, use. And it's, in essence, it's so the the system of corporate profit, the system of um, business as usual, the consumer society that we're in, um, and all of that together is the climate problem. And it's that perpetuation of business as usual, economic, energy, politics, um, and keeping everybody happy enough not to rebel, all of that um, I would take as the overall purpose of the U.S. military with the nuclear weapons as, as the Air Force says, and using a fighter-bomber type analogy, it's the top cover of, of the rest of the military. So what do you not like about burning your think is not good enough? Let's let's uh, hold that because that's a could be a deep discussion and Bernie's largely out of the picture at this point. Um, okay, now let's start the second part of this. Um, so I thought this was a pretty good paper, and so I wanted to dwell on it. Um, and this is her sort of core analogy here, um, and the we have to avoid being the people who say, oh, you have a fire in your house, I've got a glass of water for you. Um, that we have to avoid. And her, let me make sure that I'm not missing anything here. Um, right. Um, so, um, She contrasts the normal mode of functioning with what she calls the emergency mode. And here are some characteristics. Um, and the next several slides are just lifted verbatim or trimmed down from her very nicely put together paper, which you saw the link to. Um, so normally in our lives we distribute our priorities, I mean distribute our resources across several priorities, and we save some for the future. Um, in an emergency, you need, the definition of an emergency is that you're allocating huge resources toward a solution. And you have a laser-like focus, and I, so far that was kind of boring, but when it came to the source of self-esteem, <coughs> Um, individual accomplishment versus contributing to the solution, then I realized that she was saying something that was beginning to be very interesting. And we see this in our daily lives all the time, but we don't, it somehow is not normative uh, in some of our activist circles. Um, and so there is her um, what's, what would you call that? That description of, of uh, it's an observational definition of emergency mode. Um, people seek to do their part. So the military spends a lot of time <coughs> cultivating this attitude. Uh, as, as you know, uh, teamwork and uh, is a very important um, uh, core value uh, in the military. Um, uh, I had interns in Santa Fe once, uh, three young people from St. John's College, and it was kind of like a Goldilocks thing. Um, uh, they were there for the summer. One did fabulously, one did okay, and one got there late, had to leave early because of family things, and never quite figured out what was going on. So. Um, they were there working in the office. One day I went hiking in Truchas Peaks, and there were some Air Force people that had driven up there for the day from Albuquerque. And they were so focused 
and I met them on the ridge up at the Church's Peaks, and they said, you know, how are you doing? You're good? Yes, I'm good. And it was something that they brought a focus and an attention to someone else from the military. And I realized that we in the environmental peace activist world had nothing like that training. They had. Um, so yes, you. Um, so here we have uh, a, a, a trail that leads back to the university. Um, the. Uh, so, Flo. I can't pronounce his name. The book is in our bedroom. I never read the book. Um, but we all know the experience. And uh, so there are, um, these are the kind of experiences which people see um, in rock climbing, in Zen, in, um, and uh, they are an indicator of psychological health. So, and her, um, her direction is to say, let's bring this into the climate movement um, more explicitly. And I think that's great. Um, now, this is important that people must feel basically competent to handle the emergency. We have a problem in the state, certainly in, re in relation to military and nuclear issues, in that the chasm of non-democracy, I guess, between what might be considered normative, say, about nuclear weapons and the positions of our delegation. There's a huge gap. There's an enfranchisement gap in our democracy generally. So it creates a sense of helplessness. And overcoming that helplessness is um, at the top of the agenda for groups like ours. Um, now, here are, um, she got this partly from Climate Code Red, which was, I thought, one of the best books of about, I don't know, maybe somebody can remember better than me, 2008-ish, um, from Australia. And so some more characteristics of emergency mode, and they, they uh, make it political. It's the normal political paralysis mode. And we have to not play into that. Um, problem not yet serious. You know, let's have a study. Uh, let's. Um, uh, crisis is one of many issues. It's complicated. We have to go slowly. Um, and so I thought that uh, some of these are quite good. A labor market is in place. So the general feeling is that uh, labor is allocated by market forces, but in a war, that's not how it works. And so um, there's more that um, uh, the market is not the only way to allocate resources of labor and of any, every other kind. Um, budgetary restraint versus all available necessary resources. We, uh, at the moment, our society is, and all, uh, many countries of the world are borrowing like mad. So there's a huge debt that is growing very fast. I think right now, uh, our, the debt which we are incurring uh, is like five times the increase in GDP we get out of it. Um, and that, efficiency of debt creation has been falling rapidly uh, as time goes on. So the debts are not going to be repaid. So that's just how it is. These are numbers in a book, numbers on a computer screen. They're funny money. Central banks do it. Everybody's doing it. And they're never going to be repaid. Um, so there's a game of financial and musical chairs going on. and. Um, what, uh, there's no reason that we can't play this game, too. Um, uh, our right to a share of real resources at the end of the day is uh, greater than that of the military, let's say. Um, so um, we have uh, 
uh, this failure is not an option. We have a kind of a culture where we tend to um, grade politicians on their intentions and on trying, um, and because that's how we would like to be uh, judged ourselves. It's complicated, things are difficult. Um, Obama goes to um, Hiroshima and uh, he gives a speech and people say, oh yeah, you know, he means well. Uh, well, you know, he doesn't. And, um, but more than that, why, it is, why does that even matter? Um, we need to kind of upgrade our sense of civic responsibility. Um, emergency mode and normal mode are both contagious. We've all had the experience of being in a, in a crisis situation and you kind of look around at other people and they, they don't notice a crisis. There can't be a crisis if everybody else is behaving normally. And so one's response can be slowed down by needing some peer support before taking a, for breaking out of normal mode. Um, but the reverse is true also. Um, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Yeah. You know, now we better, uh, we can, so you feel stronger immediately. Um, so this is her language again. To, uh, the climate movement must lead the public into emergency mode. First, we must go into emergency mode ourselves and then communicate about the climate emergency and need for mobilization with clarity, dedication, and escalating assertiveness. So again, this, is, uh, this takes us back to the first slide, the self-revealing uh, nature of political speech. <coughs> so we reveal ourselves through our political actions and speech. And um, how to how to do that? Well, if the threat is an emergency, we need an emergency solution also. So uh, when we think about our policies, um, we have to fully adopt the language of immediate crisis and existential danger. We are not talking, uh, we are talking about the collapse of civilization, killing billions of people and millions of species. Finally, somebody else, see I feel validated because she says that, uh, <laughs> such as me. Um, these horrific outcomes await us possibly in the first half of the century, I think because of peak oil, I think very likely in the first half of the century, almost certainly. Um, and it's not about future generations, it's not about the grandchildren, it's about ourselves and our children. It's not way out there to the grandchildren. And it is far and away our top national security threat, top public health threat, top threat to the global economy. Um, yeah, so I made a note here, the, our climate policy is going to be our industrial policy, our um, economic development policy in New Mexico, our environmental policy, our education policy, our security policy, um, our uh, housing policy, zoning policy, transportation, food, water, land use, refugees, um, all of this is entailed. It's not a stovepipe. Um, Right, so here's a glass of water. Um, so, uh, and she uses again the um, sexual orientation metaphor, we need to come out as in emergency mode. Um, we don't need to soft pedal anything. And, um, let's see, gradual approaches, free market, and that's a long discussion. Um, the, all right, now here is something which is sure to um, upset uh, some of you, so um, it'll be a, um, we may have to cool the planet. And um, we don't even know if we can. Um, I mean, things are really quite terrible. 
you all know that um, uh, when uh, white ice melts off dark water in the Arctic, the albedo decreases dramatically, much more heat is absorbed in those regions. We are practically there. We could have an ice-free Arctic is this summer, possibly, um, or could be any time. And also the maintenance of temperature by absorption of heat through the latent heat of melting will also be less of a factor and the temperature could rise very quickly. It's a crisis. In the shallow Arctic Ocean there are immense amounts of methane clathrates which are decomposing and releasing methane to the atmosphere. There's enough methane clathrates to destroy life on Earth. And if they release their methane because the water gets too warm, we will all die. And so um, I find, I've read uh, some books and some articles, including people we know, Alan Robach, about the ethical issues related to cooling the planet. <clears throat> and I find them somewhat one-sided um, because Yes, something, things could go wrong, but if, uh, if the Arctic heats too much, things are wrong. So I think that that's, uh, I appreciated that she included that. Now, this we discover in our line of work as well. Um, affect phobia. Uh, and we've had to shut meetings down. Um, let's, you know, we say, let's talk about the effects of nuclear weapons. Well, it's scary. And, um, so we need an emotional shift. We have to be comfortable with emotions um, in order to talk about this. Or we will not be able to release the energy that we need to uh, change our lives and to change our politics. And this is another reason why um, you, you just can't do this alone. Uh, this I put two pages of her uh, list of false narratives uh, because they're uh, useful. They're, um, I think, and I'm sorry that I was, um, someone may ask me later, but I think we're already committed to a, a degree and a half or two degrees. We have almost a degree, I think, now, plus the heat that's been pouring into the ocean, which is not expressed yet. And then we have the um, s s pollution from um, industrial activity, which, if we were to stop, would fall out of the atmosphere in about four days, and then the sun would be brighter. And it would warm. And so we are. Uh, we will um, have to face that as we gradually uh, replace industrial activity. So, no, we don't have any safe limits. Where are we? Did you know? We should have started this in the 70s. Um, and um, we don't have any carbon budget left. Not really. We're um, and we uh, so we don't really have transition time. Uh, the clean power plan. Uh, I did the few calculations around the clean power plan and tried to talk to some environmental groups about it since I was supposed to be on a conference call and I was doing my homework. But no one wanted to talk about it um, because the clean power plan is a complete fake, and as far as I could tell. Uh, but that was not an acceptable, no one wanted to discuss that or to check. I said, please check my numbers. No one wanted to check. Um, yeah, there's a sort of sense in some people that uh, there has to be progress and growth, that everything's got to be better tomorrow than it is today. Um, well, uh, to quote, um, there was a really funny moment a few years ago at the Santa Fe City Council we heard about. <coughs> uh, after the recession, tourism was down, grocery receipts tax was down, and so the financial report came in, and the councilors were really upset, and, and um, the the chief financial officer said, well, listen, less bad is the new good. <laughs> and and uh, turn exports share to Asia, you can see it's three quarters of all oil in the Middle East that was to Asia. And that has to rise. 
um, in order for China's economy and society not to collapse. Hence Obama's um, uh, a pivot to Asia. Um, there's a problem, we have a problem with, um, suppose we try to replace everything um, in our society just as it is with, say, solar or wind. Well, it takes energy to, to create those resources, and you pay for that energy in the, up front. And if you are installing tons of new energy infrastructure of any kind, it's going to have a tremendous energy cost. The upshot of this is that we can't do it. The upshot is that the only thing that will work is a dramatic downscaling of our footprint on the planet. Then we can do the 100%. Um, but we can't do it and expect to have the life, the economy, the society, and everything that we have now. Um, the person who has probably done more on this, although his work is informal in many ways, is Ted Trainer in Australia. Uh, he's been doing it since the 80s. Um, anyway, i got to stop. Yes? Well, can, can you do the calculations yourself of how much uh, the emissions are going to have to increase when we start developing all these solar panels? That is a back-of-the-envelope calculation right there. And um, to do it properly, there's like 250 studies of the, um, of the energy you have to put in to create solar panels. And uh, in one recent uh, publication by an Italian chemist, um, that, uh, and, but so the numbers are kind of all over the map, depending on what you include. It can be as low as uh, two and a half. Um, so you can only get two and a half units of energy out for an energy, one unit of energy going in. Um, now, yeah, it's it, and it, for an intuitive uh, way to understand that, we got solar panels last year from uh, positive energy. We love those people. We love our solar panels. We love everything about it. But there's a lot of time salaries um, that go into that. There's a lot of soft costs. And we all, in our first world society, we spend that money, and that money is a lean on energy, and it's fossil fuel energy. So um, if, you know, if a third of the cost or half of the cost is a soft cost, um, that's a, you could see that a calculation that was based only on producing the solar panels would grossly underestimate the actual energy cost of installing them and going through all the paperwork from the city and all that stuff which they did for us. It took time. And but so we ourselves are health insurance. So this is where all the parasitical function the parasitical sectors of our economy come in. They use fossil fuels. I'd like to echo what you said earlier, Greg, about we can't make it unless we reduce our, our we can't make it unless we reduce our system and to address your point. We do not have the solar production capability globally to make any of these goals happen. We must do what Greg is suggesting and cut our consumption by half and not next year but tomorrow. Start cutting your consumption, convince everyone else to cut consumption because I also thank 350 for bringing Greg here because the tie-in between military and energy is really an important one because if we reduce our consumption, we are reducing the, the, the value of the spoils of war. They're over there for the resources. This is why we're making our enemies. This is why we have homeland security issues. If we reduce our energy consumption by half, then maybe Mark Jacobson's math has a chance of working. Um, Tom Solomon did a very exhaustive and important study of how we get there, and he predicts we need 488 gigafactories. Yes. That's, as, a, as someone in the business, I can say that's not going to happen. We don't have the cells, we don't have the production, and with, and with China becoming, and India surpassing China in its population by 2030, 
much of the solar production occurs in Asia already, we're not going to see very much of that. And what we do see is more expensive. So we need to cut consumption as a group, and we also have to convince others to do so as well. We need to cut by half because all these electric vehicles, <coughs> excuse me, are going to be nuclear fossil powered electric vehicles and not going to be solar powered unless we cut our consumption. Yes. Hi. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, this maybe this gentleman yeah. back here. Um, yeah. My response to your words: This is terrifying. What, yeah. what you presented is terrifying, and, and I'd like you to bring it back, if you could, to with the laser-like focus that you that you spoken of. How will our how will our society avoid an upheaval of social social um, order? Uh, yes. Kind of, uh, yes. Uh, I think I think how the answer. Will that we won't avoid it. That's the answer. It's coming to us. It's already here, and the presidential election and the popularity of Mr. Trump, the Brexit vote, all of this, the rise of the right wing in Europe, all of these are indicators that the um, social order, the neoliberal-based social order that we have based our lives on, uh, and whether we want to or not, He's not holding. And people are mad. They don't consider the government legitimate. And so I think we are going to have that upheaval. And it's a question of what kind of upheaval we have. So will it be a, an upheaval which we have some benefit from, or will it be completely destructive? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can't, you can't speak about upheaval with with such with such ease. I don't know what I don't know what to you know to say. I agree. You, know, I, you, I, you mentioned the solution because he's correct. The young people is happening. It's about to come across. us. You mentioned a solution of cooperatives. Yeah. Community anarchism, community strengthening. Those will be the survivors and the ones that are left to rebuild what's left if there is anything left. That's a really important thing. We made a cooperative. We support anyone else who wants to make cooperatives. In your neighborhood, you have five or two families, or five families, ten families. Make yourselves a cooperative in some way, shape, or form. It's easy to do it in Mexico as a legal entity. And I'd suggest you do it without PMM. You wouldn't ask Smiths if you could go and grow organic garden, you know, organic food in your garden. Why do you ask PMM to do your energy? They're not going to pay you for it anyway, soon anyway. So divorce yourself from an abusive relationship. Make your cooperatives and make yourself sustainable as communities. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, I've sir. been concerned about these issues since the 80s at least. And I've thought about it. What could we do to work our way out of this problem? And I believe we should build linear cities. And by doing so, we reduce the amount of transduction surfaces that we've created by our sprawling cities that are there for the existence of automobiles mostly. Okay. So if we consolidate the city, and I know it's going to take energy to do that, but if we consolidate the city into a smaller footprint and make systems mutually supporting yes. so that energy can cascade from high I level see. to lower, 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 lower. Mm -hmm. That way we get maximum effective use of any energy we spend. Mm -hmm. And at, at the net result is that we have a more sustainable. Yes, like using system. the waste heat right. from, for a greenhouse or something. Heat yeah. For something else yes. that needs low grade heat. Let's see, who's the Sally Elvis? Uh, how do you suggest that we get around the, uh, the public attitude that anything that, anything that, wants to, that gets in the way of my comfort and, and right. My, right. my welfare yeah. is bad? Uh, Jimmy Carter tried to, do, put, yes. to initiate yeah, yeah. the things that you're recommending here. Yes. And what happened? Ronald Reagan yeah, took right. over. What's that? Yeah, so the question was, uh, uh, how do we get around the attitude that um, really self, that we should be really selfish instead? And Jimmy Carter tried to uh, push these things, and what happened was Ronald Reagan. And so... Um, Even Margaret Thatcher tried to warn us about that. So I don't have a... I think the answer lies in 
groups of people who can model and communicate through their actions and their words, which are a form of action, a different set of values. And if those groups are attractive and persuasive, they will bring others in who see some of this for themselves. It, um, and I think that what, what we have now um, is that, uh, that we didn't have then is that the problem is really quite at our doorstep now. There's another thing we can do to cool the earth faster, and that's put a lot more trees back. Put a lot more trees back. They yeah. absorb solar energy instead of re-radiating it back into the sky. So these things, a lot of these things require money, um, and there we have people who need work. We have, um, and uh, instead of ripping off the third world, we can certainly pay the people to do this. Um, but um, we can't. We can't just afford the gigantic military that's, uh, you know, that's equal in itself to something like forty percent of the military spending on the planet. Almost used to be almost half, but um, we're prodding others to spend more. We can't afford that, plus the ridiculous health insurance industry, plus all the other wastes that we have, and also, and plus, the biggest thing is all the stuff we buy, which basically exports the climate uh, emissions to other countries and doesn't show up in our books. Yeah, Sue. Uh, two things. Number one, you made me feel guilty that I turned the AC up higher because I was warm in here, so I just turned it back down. <laughs> <laughs> two. So I have a question. Uh, I think the examples that you complimented were taking over Wall Street and NBC Studios or CBS News Studios, and I was wondering, are you suggesting we do that? Yes, I guess I am. And the uh, I think we all ought to study Gene Sharp's books on um, nonviolent action. Um, uh, Astrid has it like was had one in that index is like 289 as 198 198 canonical forms uh, as of whenever that book was published in the 80s 1973 73 okay yeah, thank you very good thank you sue <laughs> um, yes hi my name is Nathan I came because you're talking about mobilization and I came across a great handbook that recent, recently the transition handbook which really addresses exactly what he's talking about and, and maybe put it in a different perspective. It, it, it talks more about trying to approach it um, in, a, in a collective manner and, and then and working on localization. And I know there's a transition Albuquerque movement mm -hmm. and they're meeting next Wednesday at the uh, Unitarian, Unitarian Church. Church. Yeah. So I, I haven't been to it. I'm really excited about this. I was really wanting to have uh, Climate Warriors starting <coughs> and uh, being at the head of that, but... Um, yes. And, um, and there's different, there are different styles and it doesn't have to all be under some central control. Right, right. Um, you can look at us as a challenge as opposed to... Mm -hmm. So, um, Greg, I, I guess I want to take uh, a little bit of exception to some of the part of your closing, which is the uh, building our way to a renewable energy future isn't a viable alternative because the, <clears throat> the energy required to build that infrastructure has to all be fossil fuel and therefore you're going to use more energy to create it than you're going to save. So um, well, well, there let are you save immediately. Immediately. Yeah. So there are many studies, including Brookhaven National Labs and National Renewable Energy Laboratory, that calculate the energy payback time for solar panels and wind turbines. And for depending upon where you put the solar panels and what time they are, the energy payback time for a solar panel averages somewhere around 18 months. So what that means is that a solar panel in a you know location like the Southwest uh, generates in 18 months all of the energy required to produce that panel. And then the rest of its 25 year, 30 year lifetime is energy positive. So if we do things
things like um, what Elon Musk is doing for the Gigafactory that they're building in Buffalo, New York, to build solar panels, which is, you know, the first years of output is going to build massive quantities of solar panels that will go on top of the roof of that factory, and then they'll be generating the, the clean electricity required to build more. Then you don't have to end up in the situation that you're describing, where you just create more and more carbon pollution as you're creating the solution. As we begin to decarbonize the energy economy in the country, the incremental uh, output of, of energy of our energy system gets cleaner and cleaner and cleaner and cleaner as you build a higher and higher percentage of total renewable energy for that goal. And I think there is a way out of that. And uh, the energy payback time for wind turbines is even shorter than it is for solar panels. So I encourage you to go back right. and check your But I, I don't think that's true myself. But um, that I don't think that you can build out at the scale. No, not at the scale. That at, at, a, it, at a much smaller scale than you, um, if you say, in other words, you, you're retiring uh, five gigawatts of coal and replacing it with one gigawatt of solar or wind, then if, if that would be enough for us, then we, quick, then we quickly pay our price in terms of the climate for that clean energy, rather than having the massive hit for replacing our whole energy generating infrastructure, or the, a, a huge, because we also have to replace, we have to our transportation, our building systems, and all, all told, it's an enormous, because our economy is right now uh, mostly, let's say, uh, well, we have 20%, 22% uh, nuclear, and maybe with uh, hydropower, we have the about 12% renewables, including hydropower. Okay. So, but that doesn't mean we should give up on the Oh no, right. we should build. Just because we don't know exactly how to do it right now doesn't mean that that is. Oh right yes, I yes that that uh, I should have said that earlier, and that's absolutely right. We should have we should be building a gigafactory right here in New Mexico, yes. and we should be building other gigafactories also. It's just that we shouldn't, as we do this, we shouldn't conceive that in twenty thirty or twenty forty. We're all going to be living um, with the kind of um, disposing of the type of quantity of uh, energy which we are accustomed to. We need to make our energy more effective. Yeah, for Whatever effective for use. human ends. Yes, right. It's beyond the basic needs, okay, um, a lot of the rest is luxury. And we need to think about what the difference is between what I want and what I need. 